this episode of Fifth Gear, we compare drunk driving to tired driving. Plus, test drive the technology later made back from Mercedes and take a look at the new BMW 5 Series. For 25 years, we've been told that drink driving is a mugs game. One in every six deaths on our roads is related to a driver being over the limit, which makes that one for the road a sobering thought. But there could be an even bigger danger. Driving when you're tired. We've all done it, but we're taking a massive risk. Fifth gear, however, has a plan. Now, there's reams of research on driving while you're drunk, but actually very little on driving when you're exhausted. So the plan is to compare the effects of fatigue versus alcohol. Could driving whilst tired be just as dangerous as driving under the influence? To help us find out, we've got some guinea pigs. There's Adam Robertson, a 25-year-old Ford Focus driver. Lisa Clark, business advisor at a bank, and her husband, Graham, an engineer. Emma Craddock is 25 and works in PR. Steve James loves his Astra Coupe Turbo. And Andy Radley is very big in Amdram. Plus, we'll be putting ourselves to the test as well. <laughs> Cheers, Steve. Join us in a moment to see Tiff and his team getting drunk and Quentin's lot staying up all night. Then we'll put each of them in a car and put their driving to the test. Imagine your Mercedes. Luxury is what you do best. But then you learn that arch rivals BMW have bought one of the most opulent car names in the world, Rolls Royce. And they've been busy working on the recently launched Phantom, possibly the most luxurious car in the world. Yes, yes, Quinton, the Rolls looks very nice, just like your jacket. And you really must lend me that CD of classical music sometime. Nice one. Anyway, what do Mercedes do in reply? Well, they dredged their corporate history and came up with this, the Maybach. Well, there are actually two Maybachs, the Giant 62 and this compact 5.7 metre version. It weighs three tonnes, comes with 550 horsepower and can be yours for just under a quarter of a million. And if you think that's enough stats, just look what I've got to play with in here. There are 100 different pieces of wood throughout the cabin. And it's not of the fake variety. Apparently, it takes 20 work stages to join millimetre thick veneers with fine aluminium inlays before adding a final layer of cherry or walnut. Nice one. Not only have the Germans wiped out loads of forests, they've also killed plenty of cows too. But what else do you get apart from wood and leather? Well, there are two telephones. There's a fridge buried beneath here. A cigar humidor down here. Somewhere to put the old champers and a couple of flutes for the lucky passenger. A DVD player. If I operate this button, there's some natty blinds behind me. And there's a set of dials so you can keep a check on how the driver's doing. Plus, there are 10 airbags, a 600 watt stereo system with 21 speakers, and each seat has Dolby surround sound. And if I delve down here, there's also a table. Plus, if you go for the longer stretch version, which costs £265,000, you get a set of beds, just like on a VW camper. Hi, carumba. Plus, it gets even better. Every car comes with its own virtual butler, which you can call and use to book theatre tickets, reserve airline seats, and anything else that's beneath you. The Maybach is just as impressive for what you don't get as well as what you do get. There's absolutely no road noise and it's so well insulated. Well, we're in central London and all I can hear is the whisper of the air conditioning. And there's not a peep from the engine and that is staggering because underneath this bonnet is a 5.5 litre V12 bi-turbo lump that has the highest torque and power output of any series production car. But the really bonkers bit 
is that engine will get all 2.7 tonnes of this car from 0 to 60 in 5.2 seconds. 5.2 seconds! That leaves the Phantom a whole half second behind. So what do you think of that Rolls-Royce? But don't be fooled into thinking that a quarter of a million pounds suddenly entitles you to exclusivity. Apart from the stunning ride and that giant laxative of an engine, lesser mortals in their Merc S&E classes can all buy into the Maybach 57's technology, such as Sensotronic brakes, air suspension and voice-activated controls for a fraction of the price, which is annoying for this kind of money. So what do we think of the Maybach? Well, for my money, the 57 is a bit too much like a chunky S-Class, albeit a very good one. If you want one of these cars, however, my advice is to go for the Stretch 62 with everything on it, because in that very special car, Mercedes might just have something to make Rolls-Royce's eyes water. We're back investigating whether tired driving is as bad as drink driving. We're not scientific, but we are very curious. It's 2 a.m. at this hotel in Bedford. Quentin and his team have had a couple of hours sleep, and now it's time for our Karen to wake them up. Two minutes, just two. With 12 hours to go before the driving test, no snoozing was allowed. Of course, it's not just our Karen who could disturb your sleep. Anyone with a new baby knows you don't get a proper night's kip for months. Working night shifts or returning from a long-haul flight is equally disruptive. Drink driving may be socially unacceptable, but driving whilst tired is sometimes unavoidable. Fast forward to lunchtime and I'm in the chair with one of the easier fifth gear assignments, getting my team drunk. Everybody's alcohol tolerance is different and any amount of booze can affect your driving, but in general, the legal limit equates to a couple of pints for chaps or three small glasses of wine for the ladies. We checked we were over the limit with these test yourself kits and isn't it amazing how hilarious tiny things are when you've had a few. <laughs> Dark green and you're over the limit. So crunch time, the driving, on a specially designed route of twists and turns at Millbrook. With a cameraman in a sky crane watching every move, the idea is to stay between the lines, avoid the awkwardly parked car and parallel park at the end. This sober and well-rested driver proved the course could be completed with no infringements and took one minute, 28 seconds. How would the rest of us compare? First up, the tired guinea pigs. So how do you feel? I feel perfectly fine. Wobbly legs a little bit, but I'm feeling pretty good. I feel like I need to go to the blood bank to get my eyes drained. <laughs> I feel absolutely shattered. <laughs> Lisa may have looked pale and dark-eyed, but she drove pretty well. She crossed a couple of lines and was 13 seconds slower than the benchmark time, but only because she made a meal of parking. Her hubby Graham was fine too, although that's maybe because when it came to the parked car, he cut the corner. Cheeky, but hardly dangerous. Then it was Adam's turn, whose tiredness did seem to affect his driving. It wasn't long before a little telltale sign sneaked in. Get out of my way! That little outburst is completely predictable. When you're tired and ratty, road rage is much more likely. And when it came to the parking manoeuvre, well, bang goes his no-claims bonus. Temper, temper, Adam. Time for the drunken guinea pigs. No, I'm feeling absolutely fine. So sure. three pints. I've one more than maybe or maybe two more, but I'm ready to drive. <laughs> no, yeah, I feel you, fine you as well. I've yeah. run out I'm three fine, or four, I'm and fine. I'm perfectly all right. Yeah, let's do it. Would you drive Definitely. though? Would you drive? No, no, I wouldn't. What you've had now? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't drive. I can drive, but I wouldn't drive on the public roads. No, but you don't no. actually feel that bad. No, not at all. Well, we'll see. Andy went first and was very steady, but found it hard to stay between the lines, and he felt the need to talk all the time. Yeah, dizzy. No, oh, Jesus. <laughs> no. This would feel a lot better if I was sober. I'm going to that. The parking oh. manoeuvre went very well. Thank you. Till the end. 
forgot to put the handbrake in. Next up was Emma, who was really trying to concentrate hard, but she dawdled round in 1 minute and 53 seconds, didn't make complete stops, and was well over the line at the parked car. Then it was Steve's go. Once he realised the engine wasn't running, that is. <laughs> I've selected first gear, look at this, and... Uh, it's come out. We're getting no drive. The then. engine's not off. Oh, that would be why then, wouldn't it? It seemed safe to say the alcohol had magnified his natural exuberance. The stop signs tended to get overlooked, the parked car was given a particularly wide berth and he didn't hold back on the revs. And remember, a few moments ago he told us he felt fine. But it's not surprising, booze makes you feel invincible. Now we know it's unscientific, but our results do tie in with other research. The tyre drivers only made minor errors, and experts agree that constant stop-start driving like this helps stave off dozing, whereas the drunk driver's judgement had obviously been affected and they made potentially much more dangerous mistakes. Interesting results. But next up, it's Tiff's and Quentin's turn on the most dramatic test of all. Join us in a moment when we put one presenter who's shattered and one who's drunk through a motorway drive at night. Something momentous is coming. The most crucial new car of the year is about to be launched, and it's impossible to overstate its importance. Some have hailed its arrival as tantamount to the second coming. I couldn't wait to set eyes on it. But when I did... Run! It's a new BMW 5 Series! Don't look at it! Run! Run! <laughs> Well, I'm afraid my first impressions of the new 5 Series were less than positive. Mr BMW claims styling like this will be all the rage in the future. Trouble is, this is now. Somebody should tell BMW this isn't funny anymore. It's all very well making the 7 Series look ugly, because you're probably going to buy an S-Class Merc or a Jag anyway. Thing is, if you're going to make something as staggeringly important as the 5 Series look troubled, you're going to start peeing people off. The old 5 Series was seven years old, but still the undisputed champion of the world. By rights, this car should raise the bar even higher and annihilate the opposition. Instead, rivals are smelling blood. I'll tell you why I think this looks funny. The big bum. They were thinking J-Lo, or I'm thinking Fat Farm. I mean, take a look at this, Mr Cameraman. It's got loads of intersecting angles. It looks like lots of cars all stuck together at once. And, excuse me, see this, this rear overhang? Well, it's too long for the car. It's too big for the size of wheel, and it makes it look heavy. As for this swage line that you can see running all the way down here, well, it's really heavy. It drags the car down in profile. Makes it look too fat. When you get to the front, though, well, actually, that's really cool. Come and have a look. It's almost as if this car is wearing a giant pair of wraparound shades. Very, very funky, very stylish. But it's not enough to forgive that side profile. By God, this thing is going to have to be good underneath. Just like ugly girls have to be dirty. So what can Stuart in sales with the amusing tie boast about if his car hasn't got dazzling film style looks? Well, managing to be bigger and lighter is a neat trick. There's glorious build quality everywhere. Oh. And the benefit of that Whoa. big bum is a boot large enough for four golf bags. If that doesn't impress your mates, the options will. Like the £880 active steering, which at low speeds will give you full lock with just under a turn of the steering wheel. U-turns are easy peasy. The interior humidity is climate controlled, preventing mucous membranes from going dry, i.e. your snot never goes crusty. Adaptive headlamps are £900 and linked to the steering and light your way round corners, a mere 35 years after the Citroen DS first thought of it. Now, keen viewers know how I find the iDrive system on the 7 Series distracting. Well, no such problems with the 5. It has a much simpler Play School version with lots of lovely graphics to help tune the radio or indeed warm the seats. And coolest of all, £900 will buy a head-up display, like a real-deal fighter pilot. 
But are all these things a fiendish plot of smoke and mirrors distracting me from the key issue? The 5 Series has always offered a consummate driving experience. So does it still. Well, the first thing to report is the sheer loveliness of this engine. It's a 3-litre straight-six in this 530i, and it's as smooth as buttered... Uh, butter. Thing is, it doesn't feel that fast, but crucially, it's smoother and more powerful than the V6 unit they put in the Merc E-Class. You can get a 6-speed manual, a 6-speed automatic, or an SMG semi-automatic paddle shift gearbox. There are a few more engines on the way, though, and the one to watch out for is the 500 horsepower V10 M5, which should put the frighteners on things like jets and slow missiles. Now, this active steering that's so useful in car parks gets much less sensitive when you go a bit faster. Thing is, it takes some getting used to. It doesn't feel particularly numb or artificial, but you do know that something's going on. It's linked to the stability control, and if it senses the car might wag its tail, applies a tiny amount of corrective steering to dampen the wiggle. Theoretically, it means the DSC doesn't have to cut in so early and apply the brakes, which keeps cornering much zoomier. But if all that sounds too intrusive, fear not. You can turn it off. Prices for the 530 will be around £30,000 when it arrives in September. In a nutshell, you have to say that even if it's not very pretty, it is dead brainy. Look, you've got to ask yourself, do you want to turn up to a party and say, be my wife, I know, I know she's really ugly, but she is very clever. Or would you like to turn up to that same party and say, meet my wife, and yes, she is a supermodel. Face it, we're shallow people. Looks are everything. And BMW, well, I'm not sure they've got it right. Ah, but thing is, a Merc E-Class, well, it's plasticky and dead clinical inside. A Jag, well, that's for old men, and the A6, it's just old. So are you going to buy a five? Well, you are, because BMW's got you over a barrel. It's still the class leader. <laughs> This is COG, the car ad unlike any other car ad, that's made us forget in an instant. Vorsprung durch Technik, Peugeot's in Fields of Flames, Papa and Nicole. It's currently entertaining the world in a commercial break near you, and it's remarkable because there are no special effects or computer tricks involved. It's all done for real. A team of engineers and sculptors stripped 200 cords to the bare bones, chose 85 key components and then toiled on a script for a month. After six more months of painstaking drawing and testing, they were finally ready to film. But all did not go according to plan. Just being a few millimetres out would ruin the momentum of the chain reaction and mean a complete reset. In fact, they went without sleep for four days, doing 606 takes before everything finally worked as it should. The best bits have to be the wheels that climb uphill, thanks to precisely laid weights, and the rain-sensitive wipers that crab across the floor. Critics are sure that despite its relatively low £750,000 cost, COG will sweep the board at the forthcoming advertising awards, and debate over its inspiration is already raging. Was it the board game Mousetrap, or was it a little-known Swiss animated film? Either way, who'd have thought all those trendy advertising execs would get so excited by humble transmission bearings? Who do they think they are? The MG Owners Club? We revealed earlier that around a twisty route, driving while tired didn't seem as bad as driving while drunk. But now there's a harder test, a motorway at night. How will the monotony of mile after mile affect a snoozy me and a boozy Tiff? We'll each spend 30 minutes lapping the closed bowl at Millbrook with an observer watching our every move. The challenge? To stay within one lane and maintain a speed of between 60 and 70 miles an hour. I would go first, and having peaked and troughed all day was definitely at a low ebb. With the observer aboard, it's that man again, we were on our way. Um, 
quite surprised how knackered actually I am. I'm so tired, I'm having to wear my glasses, which I never ever do, and already I can feel it. I mean, I just don't know where I'm going, and I'm just following the white lines, wanting this to be over as quickly as possible. So-called highway hypnosis is most likely to occur between 2 and 6 a.m. when your biorhythms are at a natural low. The accidents are potentially much worse because the driver asleep at the wheel simply won't break before a crash, so the impacts are much faster. So what should you do? Try and uh, take uh, one or two cups of uh, coffee, caffeinated coffee or a caffeinated drink. Uh, and uh, caffeine takes about 20 minutes to have an effect. So you have an opportunity there for doing something else. And that something else should be take a quick nap. Just uh, settle back in your car seat, lock the car, make sure you're safe, and shut your eyes for 10 to 15 minutes. Even though you're not necessarily sleeping, the shutting, resting your eyes, having a quick zizz, that is effective. It's far better to do that whilst the coffee's kicking in than in going for a fresh air or exercise or take a break in other ways. During my 30 minutes, I drifted across the white lines three times and my speed wavered significantly nine times, and I hadn't a clue. Then it was Tiff's turn. We'd kept him topped up all day and checked he was just over the legal limit. Minus three, minus three. Attention, it is essential that you read the instructions. Highway code takes precedence. And with those thoughts ringing in his ears, we sent him away. Now, of course, I, I know I'm over the limit, and yet somehow I feel <laughs> very able to drive. It's quite frightening. I feel fine. I can just ease the speed up and go for a nice long cruise which is exactly what he did, and seemed to keep an active mind the whole time. Where's the clock in this car? His headlights are rubbish. I remember when I was breaking the speed record for comic relief at 200 miles an hour in a McLaren. It took about 39 <laughs> seconds. Now it's taking two minutes. The temperature's gone up from minus three to minus two, so it's getting warmer. <laughs> Tiff drove perfectly. In terms of steering a steady course and speed, it was an error-free performance. But even though I'm over the limit, I know my reactions probably aren't very good, but just cruising, concentrate. I can do it. But I still wouldn't have dared drive on the public road. I was fine on my own, but I couldn't be sure how well I'd be able to react if there was other traffic around me. Driving steep is probably worse than driving uh, over the limit. In fact, uh, we think, from the research we've done here, that more people are killed on our roads in this country through falling asleep at the wheel than uh, being over the limit with alcohol. We all drive sleepy, and we've all had experience of doing that. People just don't realise that it is far more dangerous to drive while sleepy than actually slightly over the limit. So, it's the morning after. He smells like a brewery and has a jackhammer hangover. He's been yawning his head off all the time. But what have we learned? Well, it's important to say that we haven't exactly done this with the rigours of science. But there's no doubt that driving whilst drunk on the city course led to some dangerous over-exuberance. <laughs> but I know that if I'd had to go around that ball for another 10 minutes, I would have started to snore, crashed and died. So the next time someone says to me, I can't drive because I'm exhausted, I won't be calling them a fairy, because I'll know exactly how dangerous it really is. Oh.